Mr. Lloyd. Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, just before I leave the, the first part of our ground one argument, I should just say that we've posed our submissions by reference to the counterfactual that the applicant posits in their written submissions at paragraph 25. That's what they, that's how they posit, uh, how they posit their counterfactual, which is that because the minister addressed the prospect of the applicant's presence in Australia fostering anti-vaccination, he should have considered um, the prospect of his absence. Then in his oral submissions, my friend posited counterfactuals in different ways, some broader, some less clear. Um, I'll just give your honour a reference, 28.37 to a different positing. Um, if I just say that we've sought to address what is in the written submissions to the extent that one conceives of it as being broader in a sense that helps us because the broader the counterfactual is, if one conceives the, the counterfactual as what would have happened, what would happen if the minister had have not cancelled, or had, had have cancelled, sorry, what would have happened if he had have not cancelled, that was obviously considered, That's that was the concern that led to the, to the, to the, to the risks, um, and the, the risks of what would happen if cancelled, they were, as I've indicated already, expressly a whole a raft of concerns were considered by the minister in that regard, and he had evidence about it. So the broader it is, um, the harder it is to, to get to the point of suggesting that um, it wasn't considered because some of them are just expressly considered. The narrower it is, the harder it is to draw an inference that it wasn't considered just because or that it even had to be considered because it's, the more specific it is, do you, uh, the, the, what about this particular consequence? Did he consider this very specific thing? So we, we just say there's an issue about what the counterfactual is, but in any event, yeah. I, another, I have on that. Another way of thinking about this, that I was thinking about over lunch, that in a sense, trying to reconcile the competing contentions about the, the submissions that were before the minister and that the minister must have seen them and must have understood they were there, etc. One way of putting it, and I'd be interested to see what you say about it in terms of both as a question of fact and as what its consequences were, is that it might be that you, if I may put it this way, you are correct to the effect that much of this can be seen in the submissions in in uh, the, the existence of um, uh, other groups that may uh, have an anti-vaccination predisposition or uh, view, uh, the possibility of um, antagonism about um, <clears throat> the withdrawal of the, the cancellation of the visa, et cetera, et cetera. And one can, on this hypothesis, readily accept your, uh, your submissions that this kind of problem was, in a sense, of, within the, the submissions that the minister in a case such as this, one would hardly infer that he didn't read. That said, what he what he didn't do, on one view, was was finally balance the weighing of them. And uh, the answer to that may be that he didn't have to. But so that one can see a a, a, a lack of balancing of one against the other without denying the, the notion that he was alive to problems in the future if he did cancel. Um, and then one goes back to what the statutory task is uh, and what, uh, what consequence there is if he, un he understood aspects of the future but simply did not um, as it were, finally weigh the the alternative binary potential detriments. 
Well, we would say that you, Your Honour not only should find that, that he had the issues before him and they were in his mind, but they must have been part of his consideration of the balance. So, for example, in paragraph 46, he says, I also acknowledge that Mr Djokovic um, is now in the community and that some unrest has already occurred such that it is too late to avoid um, this is in my mind. This is in my mind against the public interest in cancellation. So um, he, he he is aware of unrest and he, and he is taking it into account. I accept that he hasn't said, you know, expressly the other thing. But it's very hard to imagine that he wasn't aware of the possibility of further unrest of the exact kind that he's exactly just mentioned there. Um, yeah. And the answer may be that it don't, it, 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 one doesn't have to frame it in um, frame the debate in some analysis uh, of finally balancing opposite courses of action. It's, it's sufficient that it's before you taken into account and one can see that um, there's a degree of consideration. We would certainly embrace that, certainly. Um, if I go on to our next section and our written submissions is C2, so this this is now, as it were, on the assumption that we've lost the first ground. If we win the first ground, that's the end of ground one. If we lose the first ground, so the court is now considering the situation that um, the the counterfactual wasn't considered, then we still have an argument um, to the effect that that isn't um, a jurisdictional error. We address in paragraph 65 to 70 some uh, authorities which the court will be very familiar. I, I won't even speak to them, uh, other than to draw particular attention to 69 and 70, the kind of language for an unreasonableness case about it being necessarily stringent test, you know, not lightly interfere, you know, needing ex extreme illogicality. And, and, and a reference which I don't think we have in our submissions, but I'll, I'll just give to the court now. It's it's the reasons of Chief Justice Gleeson in Re-Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs, ex parte applicant S20 of 2002, mm -hmm. In 2003, 77 Australian Law Journal reports 1165 at paragraph five, where he's on, I said, to the effect that even emphatic disagreement doesn't demonstrate unreasonableness or illogicality. Um, so we say, say that to sort of set, set a kind of the background principles. Um, then against that, we look at, at this case. Um, um, and we say it has to be decided in whether something is unreasonable has to be decided in a statutory context that that here is section 133 capital C3 um, first there's no statutory criteria identifying what the minister must consider in addressing the public interest so that's a very broad scope um, uh, nor does the act identify any matter that must be considered in exercising the discretion uh, whether or not to cancel. So that is a further broad scope. Um, probably it's convenient now to say something about a case my friend uh, mentioned, which is Acting Minister for Immigration, Citizenship, Migrant Services and Multicultural Affairs and CWY 20, 2021, FCA FC 48, I think it's in my friend's bundle. I think it was actually provided very shortly before the hearing this morning, in fact. Um, now, in that case, first of all, I ask the court to get a section to paragraph 133. Um, we would certainly embrace what is said there in which, uh, Your Honour, Justice Pasenko, I think, um, was observing that um, sort of questions of this kind, 
um, as to whether, well, I'll just read it. For these reasons, the primary judge's conclusions that the acting minister did not give active consideration uh, to Australia's non reforming obligations in his assessment of the national interest is correct. That is a factual finding, and I do not consider the reference to Karaskalau a different case uh, with different reasons and issues to be of assistance. So the, the notion that it's a kind of uh, fact-specific issue, um, uh, we embrace. Uh, the next thing I'd say about the case is we um, uh, also don't challenge or dispute what is said in paragraph 157 or 160, um, that the mere fact that something is a non, that, that something is not a mandatory relevant consideration, that fact alone doesn't mean that it cannot be unreasonable for a decision maker not to consider it. And in paragraph 160, uh, in the fourth line, the point that is made there is a reference is made to section 501A2 um, uh, that, that a, com a comment is made in relation to that, that oh, oh, obviously to that extent um, that the case affects no qualification to our case so uh, it doesn't trouble us. Um, we embrace what we think is explicit or at least the very much implicit in your honour's judgment and, and, and that is that unreasonableness depends on particular circumstances of the case I won't take you on this to it, but we rely upon paragraphs 148, 149, and 154. And what was important in, in CWY 20, as we read it, is the clarity with which the acting minister had in substance found that an immediate consequence of his own decision was that Australia would be in breach of international obligations. Um, and yet not not having regard to what the consequences um, of that would be and taking that into account. Um, we say that that is a very different case to this um, in, in, a, in a different uh, a different nature. And so it doesn't, it's not a case which requires your honours to come to the view that um, uh, that there would be unreasonableness here if the matter was considered. One has to look at it in the circumstances of the statutory circumstances. And here, statutory circumstances are not about Australia's international obligations or, or provisions um, which actually have been understood, at least by reference to um, the, the practice in the 501 area to have regard to such things. Um, but this is an area where the minister has a very broad discretion. The second aspect of statutory um, relevance here is section 116 1E1. So that's the power which is being relied upon. Now the focus on that section, I think we've taken the court to it earlier, is um, the presence of a visa holder in Australia. That is, it asks what will happen if the visa holder obtains or retains a presence in Australia. Um, uh, obtains, because it applies if somebody's outside of Australia, and retains if they're in Australia. Um, and if I just give the court a reference to um, the decision of in Justice Colberg in, in Tian uh, and the Minister, 1998-89 Federal Court Reports 80 at 94. Um, uh, there is no um, statutory counterfactual that is required, we say, under, the, under Section 116.1e. It doesn't ask what might happen if the person is removed or, or not present in Australia. We do not say that it's, that's an irrelevant consideration. Um, it's something that could be considered. It's just not a mandatory consideration. Um, um, there's nothing in the text which suggests that looking at a counterfactual 
uh, or failing to look at a counterfactual would be irrational or unreasonable. Um, the powers in section 116 and 133 reflect a sovereign right of the Commonwealth to determine who is bound to be in Australia. The Commonwealth ought not to be bound to, to suffer the presence of an, of an alien for fear of what might occur if they were removed, which is in essence what, what the applicant's case requires. We have to, we might have to allow an alien to be here um, because we're concerned about what would happen if we removed them. Um, we say given the breadth of the public interest and the discretion and the breadth of the matters that the minister did consider, it, it doesn't follow that the minister from, from the minister not considering the counter argument, if that's what the court finds, that he transgressed the bounds of reasonableness. Um, now, that counter argument is really just one factual dimension of the risk of unrest. Um, and the minister clearly turned his mind to that topic. The last issue we address in relation to ground one is materiality. Um, the way we put that is that um, when, well, first of all, the onus for establishing materiality lies on the applicant. Um, he would need to establish that had the minister considered the specific thing he said was not considered, um, the result could realistically be different. Uh, paragraph 78, we say that the court should not be satisfied that there is such a realistic possibility of a different result. We say that because when one considers the matters, and we say in our written submissions 48 to 59, but those paragraph numbers were not updated, so it should be 49 to 60. Um, that there are the matters I've taken the court through, the sort of broad ranging considerations about the consequences of the decision, that broad range of consequential analysis that was taken, that um, there's no reason to believe that um, uh, the, the issue said to have not been considered could have made a difference. We say the minister was well aware of anti-vaccination activist groups. He was aware that they idolized the applicant for his stance on vaccination. He was aware of the prospect of discord. Um, he, he was aware of uh, competing groups and views in Australia. He was aware of the likelihood of publicity, whatever the outcome. Now, what on that hypothesis did the minister not consider um, uh, was how all of the things accumulate to some very upset people if, if the decision was cancelled. We say that that that's an, an incremental drop of thought of what was already a very substantial pool of thinking on, on the whole consequences issue, and it could not realistically have made a difference to his honour's outcome. That's all we wish to say about ground uh, one. I might now go to ground three, because in a sense it logically comes before ground two at least on our way of thinking it does. Um, it's the, our submission start, or the relevant bits of our submission start at a paragraph 105. Um, it was said that it was not open to find that the applicant opposed vaccination um, against COVID-19. And the materials I took the court to in an extra B provide, we say, ample support for the view the applicant is opposed to this vaccine. Um, we refer again in paragraphs 107 to 109 to that material. Uh, I won't go through it again. Um, in a no evidence case, there only needs to be a skerrick of evidence. Um, uh, and, and there's much more, there are not only multiple skerricks, there's actually material substance to suggest that. Um, and, and we rely upon that. I should, there was one further matter, which maybe to answer my friend's submission, he sort of said something like, this is really perhaps going into the next limb of the case, but it occurs to me now. He says, well, there should be evidence that if Mr. 
Mr. Uh, uh, the applicant has has a has an effect upon um, the level of vaccination. You know that should have occurred by now, and there should be evidence of that. You know, I accept that the minister doesn't put it in these terms, but if the court looks at paragraph, sorry, page 29, page 29 of our submissions in the um, annex, one would apply common sense, think that Mr. Djokovic's um, iconic status must be highest of all in Serbia. So if, if you were going to see an effect that his anti-vaccine views might have, one would see it in Serbia. What that evidence does show in about the sixth paragraph or the second paragraph from the bottom, it says in Djokovic's home country, where it is estimated that under half the population is fully vaccinated against COVID, his comments were criticised at the time of government epidemiologists, uh, etc., by creating misconception. So in that context, um, uh, we don't accept that that is something that had to be done, but um, such as it was, there is even some evidence that um, uh, of, of this. So, if the minister had to find such evidence, it, it was even even before him. Um, now, while that's all I want to say about that part of ground three, we say that's clearly open. That the fact that the applicant has a, is opposed to vaccination against COVID-19 in, in the sense discussed by the minister. Then there's a paragraph 99 and following. There's a discussion of a failure to make obvious inquiries point. Um, in paragraph 100, we refer to the authorities that indicate that this is a rare ground and one difficult to make out. The mere fact that it might be, might have been reasonable to make an inquiry does not make the person bound to make it. Uh, I won't ask the court to go to it, but in tab 11 of the bundle, there is a case called Kaur, or Kaur, I'm not sure how that's pronounced, versus Minister for Immigration and Border Protection, 2017, 256 Federal Court Reports, 235, uh, and at paragraph 33, um, uh, the full court, um, so the full court uh, endorsed various single judge decisions at that point to to the to the effect that I just said, which is that um, uh, just because it would have been reasonable to make an inquiry doesn't mean that it's unreasonable not not to make the inquiry. Um, in relation to this, we then address three reasons why this failure to make an inquiry point should be rejected here. The first is whatever the applicant might have said um, in a letter in response to such an inquiry about his current vaccination views would not have altered the fact of his previous stated views and the impression held by the Australian community. And as my friend has made clear when he's gone through the minister's reasons, uh, you know, a large part of the issue is not just what his his views are, but how his views are perceived um, and relevantly among the Australian community. So to that extent, um, it's not it's no reason to think that it was a that there was any duty to inquire. The, the next and second point is that there's no evidence before the court that the applicant could or would have put forward any useful material to the minister had his views been sought. Um, he has chosen not to put on any evidence in these in this trial. That material we say is, is required and in, in that respect we refer the court to the Minister for Immigration and Citizenship and SZIAI 2009-83 Australian Law Journal Reports 1123 at paragraph 26, that is uh, the High Court uh, saying it, probably in obiter there, but still it's the High Court's obiter. Um, and then we also refer the, refer the court to a decision of Justice Stewart of this court in ERE 18 and the Minister for Home Affairs number 2, 
2021 FCA 1346 at paragraph 50. I won't take your honours to it, but it's tab nine of our bundle. And that was in the context of the immigration, uh, the IAA, uh, and, and whether it unreasonably failed to obtain new information. And his honour noted that uh, there that no evidence had been adduced as to what new information could have been um, provided. And so we say this is simply a consequence of the principle that the applicant has the onus to make out the point and they haven't made out the point. Um, and the third reason is in relation to our submissions on the alleged failure to acquire. Any such failure has to be conceived of, um, we say, as either legal unreasonableness, so that the failure itself isn't a jurisdictional error, but if it constitutes legal unreasonableness or a constructive failure to exercise jurisdiction, then it could be. Um, for that proposition, um, we rely upon what Her Honour Justice Bennett said in SZMJM and the Minister for Immigration and Citizenship, 2010 FCA 309 and 30, um, which is one of the cases that was approved in call, which I mentioned earlier. And in SZIAI, the High Court wrote in terms of unreasonableness and constructive failure as well at paragraph 27. And we say here that there could be no constructive failure to exercise the power under section 133 C3 by not seeking information or comment from the applicant when it's recorded that the minister is not, a, not bound to accord procedural fairness. Um, that's a significant um, factor on affecting what was required. More significantly, the minister, we say, didn't overlook the, the possibility of asking the question, so it's not unreasonable. He adverted to it in paragraph six of his reasons, which I've already taken the court to and I won't go back to. Um, and he says his reasons for not doing it, which are not unreasonable or even said to be unreasonable. Uh, And in the IAA context, um, in, in matters concerning challenges to not obtaining information, the giving of intelligible reasons for not obtaining new information has been sufficient to uh, avoid findings of unreasonableness. And I'll give you on as an example of that at DYK 16 and the Minister for Immigration 2018, 267 Federal Court Report 69. The minister is engaged in reasoning, um, sorry, the minister also engaged in reasoning, um, alive to the fact that the applicant's views had not been sought. Um, and he makes that clear in paragraph seven. Um, no challenge to that statement has been made. And we say it should be accepted at face value. So we say there could be, in any event, no unreasonableness or failure to exercise jurisdiction in the circumstances of this case. That brings me to the last ground, which is ground two. Um, it starts at paragraph 79 of our submissions. That ground challenges the finding of the minister along the, along the way to being satisfied of the ground in 1161E1. The finding that is challenged is that the applicant's presence in Australia may foster uh, anti-vaccination sentiment. Uh, the first section, um, I think before I go to that, uh, my friend also makes this point about paragraphs 19 and 39 of the minister's statement I think this is as apt a place as ever to deal with it. So he reads paragraph 19 of the minister's statement to say something which it just simply doesn't say. He reads paragraph 19 to say, as if he says, I, the minister, have no idea what Mr. Djokovic's views are about vaccination. And then my friend says, well, how ridiculous is that? In paragraph 39, he purports to say that they're well known. Um, this is the, the most egregious breach of the Wu Shang principle you can imagine. It has to be read as a whole. He doesn't say in paragraph 19 that he doesn't have a view on what Mr. Djokovic's 
views about vaccination are. He just says, which is accurate, he didn't ask for, as it were, an updated view, what his present attitude is. Um, uh, and then he explains why. So there is no tension. So to the extent that my friend's argument about there's some illogicality in it or unreasonableness or there's no basis for it. I mean, it's clear that there's a basis for, for the view as to Mr. Djokovic's views about vaccination. And paragraph 19 is provides no tension. My friend just, we say, misreads it. Um, now, returning then to um, ground two, um, the nature of the finding here is that um, the applicant, not that he has fostered or will foster, it is that he may foster um, anti-vaccination sentiment. Uh, uh, now, in terms of section 116E1, it is about whether something, namely presence of the person in Australia, may, we focus on that word may, be a risk, focus on the word risk to, to something else. And the something else in this case is harm, harm to health, safety or the good order of the Australian government. So then at 83 of our submissions, we focus upon the word risk and point out that it has a future element to it. Um, it speaks of the future that I'm told by my friend is uncontroversial, so I can move past that. Then in, in 85, um, uh, to 87, we, we look at the word may and the, the legislative history, which shows the, the uh, lowering of the threshold from what used to be is or would to instead be is or may or would or might. Um, that amendment in itself to anybody who reads it would think, oh, well, oh, the parliament's obviously trying to lower the threshold. Uh, if there's any doubt about it, the explanatory memorandum expressly says that they seek to lower the threshold. That's in paragraph 86. Um, and in 87, we say uh, it has also been construed as lowering the threshold. So we say that that's right. Now, what is addressed in 88, which my friend embraces as well, is uh, our cases about um, what happens when courts, those two cases cited there, and what happens when courts make assessments as to the future, and they are allowed to, um, you know, undertake reasonable conjecture, um, uh, having regard to, you know, what's known and past events. Um, and, uh, but that, the fact that the, that the process is a process of reasonable conjecture still has to be read with the actual test being the low test of is or may be. Um, uh, and so, as it were, 88 doesn't cancel out everything that comes before it. It, it works with them. And so what the minister, and, and that, if that's what's required of the courts, then administrative decision maker obviously has more flexibility than a court in terms of that kind of future gazing. Um, and a minister undertaking a, a broad public interest, non compelable power, we would say, um, it is broader even still. Um, but Mr. Lloyd, engaging with what's put against you, I think, as I would understand it, Mr., you can correct me or the Wood would correct me, that Mr Wood, in a sense, in his submission, he's saying, well, where's the evidence? They have to have facts. And we could have had um, uh, examples in other places from the last year of encouragement, as it were, or, in, or, or people following uh, his lead, if I may use that expression. But... Uh, uh, but it's important, I think, to identify the, the two, wrong to put them into two categories, but, but for the purposes of discussion, I'll use two categories. That is, one, being, a, being um, 
uh, taken up by uh, those who have strong anti-vaccine vaccine vaccination views. But second is a more is a is a much broader concept of uh, an iconic uh, sports star setting an example uh, that is not wished to be followed. Uh, and 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 as I would understand your submission is that the notion that you have to lead evidence about what effect he had in the United States of America or somewhere else or somewhere else is just not to the point. You, one can use one's common sense and, in, and human intuition about this from how people behave. Um, and take the example, um, if Mr Djokovic, uh, as he has done on a number of occasions in the past, won the Open, uh, there's an example it, embedded in the Minister's reasons is there's an example for young and not so young fans of tennis. Indeed, and, and, and our point is that um, we don't. First of all, we don't have to show what what happens in Serbia or America, wherever else he's played tennis. That it's not required. Um, there, there was that bit of evidence which I took the court to about Serbia, anyway. But more importantly, and more recently, maybe because of perhaps inevitably because of more recent events, the, the applicants' views about or understood, widely understood views about vaccination have been come to the fore. So they're right in people's minds at the moment. The minister has to make a decision about risk having regard to what has just happened recently and, and how, how he has now become an icon for um, the anti-vaccination groups. Um, and uh, then what role that will have if him, you know, somebody of his um, significance um, being present in Australia um, at, at a time when that is the issue. And the, the minister clearly sees that there's a risk that in the same way as, um, you know, I don't want to, I, I won't do that. <laughs> in, the, in the same way as Mr Djokovic advertises or associates himself with a whole array of products um, and, and no doubt because of his um, popularity and um, status that does well for those people uh, who, who engage him uh, for his endorsements. Um, rightly or wrongly, um, he, he, he's perceived to endorse um, an anti-vaccination view and, um, and that is perceived, his presence here is perceived to, to contribute to that and to foster further sentiment of more people who are maybe undecided becoming anti-vaxxers. And, and then, of course, if that happens, that's what leads to the, the health care consequences. Um, and we just say that the, the known facts, the facts of Mr Djokovic's um, uh, views, uh, or at least the perceived views, the knowledge of his perceived views, uh, and his historical views um, and his unanswered views um, in combination with his status and presence uh, could be seen to contribute um, significantly to those issues. And that's all that's required to, to make the inference that the minister made. So on that basis, we say there was evidence. It was just starts with, with, with the material that we've said and then one draws inferences from that being not wild inferences, inferences that people of Mr Djokovic's status are able to influence people who look up to him. And, and that seems to be, one might have thought, common sense and uncontroversial in, in, in having regard to how celebrities um, engage in, in all kinds of, not just commercial advertising, but all kinds of other um, political and other other roles. And the, the last, I think that probably answer, I've addressed paragraphs 90 to 91 of our submissions on the no evidence point. We, we basically say that there is evidence to sufficient to draw the inference that was drawn. Then there is an illogicality point which starts from 93 to 98. Um, we have, I think, in substance addressed 
that issue uh, already as well, but we say it's not illogical and um, uh, that's that's really ground three other iteration. Indeed, we think it, that's how we see it, um, and we've probably approached it in that way. So I think I've addressed that. You know, just it was I think one thing I had not um, yet gone to addressed that. Um, I've addressed that. <laughs> Uh, may it please the court, we would say um, each of the grounds should be dismissed and um, there should be an order that the applicant pay the minister's costs. Thank you, Mr Lloyd. The Wood, in reply. Thank yes, Your Honour, a brief reply. Uh, I'll only reply on ground one. My reply points are inspired partly by two questions from the bench. One was a question of Justice Pisanko before lunch, and one a question from Your Honour the Chief Justice to my opponent after lunch. And the underlying issue here I might call awareness versus consideration. Justice Pisanko's question to my learned friend was, is it sufficient that the minister was aware of the matter or is it necessary to show that he was aware of it and took it into account and conducted some sort of balancing exercise and so on? And whilst I don't have in print in front of me, you're on the Chief Justice's question, I gather that it was rather the same issue. It was, really the same. it was really the same issue. I think you can deal with them together. Yes, I, I, I will, thank you. Now, the answer, Your Honours, is, is that consideration was required in the circumstances of this case. The reason, Your Honour, is helpfully illustrated by the decision of CWY20, which was referred to by me earlier and by Mr Lloyd, but again, the citation 2021 FCA FC uh, 195. Now, different decision, but shared some common features. So that was a decision under 501 capital A of the Act which is a power of the minister without natural justice to in effect substitute for a favourable decision of the tribunal, an unfavourable decision of the minister. The conclusion of the court, five members of the court, including, as I recall, <laughs> Your Honour the Chief Justice and Justice Pisanko, was that in the circumstances of that case, it was unreasonable for the minister not to consider the consequence of the decision that he ultimately made, but for the challenge, being reformant of the applicant from uh, Australia, given the way that the minister had framed his own reasons. The point was, this is the critical point of CWY20, that what the minister had said in his reasons demonstrated that he was aware that if he made the cancellation decision the consequence would be that the applicant would be refooled by operation of the various provisions of the Act that made, at that point in time, removal mandatory despite the existence of non-reformant obligations. The critical point, or a critical point of the judgment, is the paragraph that I referred to earlier, which was 130 within the reasons of Justice Pisanko, where, Your Honour, Justice Pisanko, citing the various cases therein, said, well, in effect, there's ample authority for the proposition that one doesn't read into a statement of reasons produced by a decision maker, findings, reasoning, in effect, consideration of a matter that aren't there. Now, it was trite, it was the very precept for the controversy in CWY20 that the minister was aware that non reformment would be the consequence, but the conclusion of the court was it was unreasonable not to consider that in assessing the national interest. Now that is a useful illustration of a few points. One is this, that unreasonableness, and that may be the more apt concept to apply with respect to ground one than irrationality, but they're obviously concepts that are informed by the same underlying legal values. Unreasonableness can be used to deprecate 
not only findings and reasoning as expressed, but the process by which the decision was reached. And in CWY20, what made the process unreasonable was the fact that the consequence of the decision, reformant, was not considered. So as the court was at pains to point out, despite the minister's strenuous arguments to the court in that case, it wasn't about PICO walls and mandatory consideration. The point was the minister, by his own findings and reasoning, had in effect rendered it, uh, it, 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 the consequence of the minister's own findings and reasoning meant that it was unreasonable not to consider the very consequence that the minister's adverse decision would have being reformed. So that reflects, of course, High Court authority. Again, this is fairly trash, but it just occurred to me when I was thinking about this earlier, so I'll mention it, which is ABT 17, 2020, 269, Commonwealth Law Reports 439, where a majority of the High Court at paragraphs 19 and 20 make that point quite crisply, that unreasonableness can deal with not only findings and reasoning, but process leading to the point. What now, was the paragraph number? Sorry. Paragraphs 19 and 20. Now, let in that context, let it be assumed for the sake of argument that the minister was aware that an adverse decision of the kind that he made might be apt to stoke anti-vax sentiment. Let's assume for the purpose of discussion, I'm not admitting this, let's assume, however, for the purpose of discussion that he might have been aware of that either in the sense that the minister is a member of our society and there was a protest in Melbourne during the week or whatnot, so if you like common knowledge, or perhaps let's assume that the minister was aware of that because of the content of the back end of the BBC report that expressly said that there'd been anti-vaxxer activity galvanised by the cancellation uh, decision. The, the point and the, the essence of ground one is this, and it's why it shares features with C. WY20. As soon as you accept, as we say the court ought to, that the minister had clearly identified, particularly as bearing on what the minister thought bore on the public interest, paragraph 39, the, the risk of doing anything that would strengthen anti-vax sentiment, that was the minister's own chosen criterion or issue of concern. As soon as the minister did that, linked it appropriately in the exercise of his broad evaluative powers to his own assessment of what bore on the public interest, it's a critical feature of his decision. If one attributes, as I've contemplated, awareness to the minister by either of, or both of the means I've suggested, common knowledge or awareness of the relevant part of the BBC article, then it becomes perverse or unreasonable, is a perhaps fairer term, for the minister not to do something with that awareness in assessing where he thought the public interest lay. In other words, if the minister was aware, then it called for an evaluation. It called for a balancing. Now, this is what segues, and I'm, I'm at least halfway through the reply, don't be too concerned. This is what is a useful segue to what I might call the Talahi point. Now, respectfully, Mr Lloyd hasn't really distinguished Talahi. It's on all fours. <laughs> Same comprehensive statement of reasons, described as a statement of reasons, identify those features in particular by the full court as the basis upon which inferences that something not mentioned were not considered. The height of Mr Lloyd's argument, and it's not that high, is that one might take um, bits and pieces of the minister's reasons or perhaps common knowledge to suggest a possible awareness. But what, what one does not see, and we don't accept that, but I'm, I'm treating it as, as, as the premise for the purpose of this uh, point in argument. What, doesn't, what one doesn't see is what one would expect to see in a document styled as a statement of reasons, apparently comprehensive, an engagement by the minister in a necessarily evaluative exercise of where the public interest lay, if indeed, as again I've indicated, for the sake of argument, 
awareness of the possibility of anti-vax aggravation consequences, coercive state action, in other words, cancellation and removal, uh, was in play. Now, can I, can I conclude the point in this way? The relevant attachment, setting aside common knowledge, if you like, as I, as I said repeatedly in submissions in chief, the only relevant evidence was attachment H. But attachment H spoke to various different things. Page one or page two, if you like, was, the, was essentially the point in April 2020, Mr Djokovic said some things about vaccination. It is that aspect of attachment H and only that aspect of attachment H that is referred to by the minister in his reasons. That's paragraph 18 and paragraph 41. Nowhere, anywhere in the reasons, does the minister refer specifically or by any fair inference to what I'll call the second half of the BBC article, which spoke to the anti-vaxxer aggravation that has emerged, at least in Melbourne, in part this week in response to the cancellation decision. One simply doesn't see it. So, so it is, Your Honours, getting back to this distinction between awareness and consideration, a stretch indeed even for the Minister to submit that the Minister was aware of it. All that the Minister did was speak to a quite distinct proposition emerging from that document. But as I've said, even if the Minister was aware of it, even if it's to be assumed in the Minister's favour that he carefully read the whole document, the whole BBC report, what is damning in my submission in light of the Minister's own clear articulation, particularly in 39 of his reasons, of what concerns him, anti-vaccination sentiment, that there is no, not even a reference to the evidence, but certainly no discussion or weighing of it in the ultimate assessment of the public interest. And that leads to my final point, and it might be thought obvious, but it needs to be said. A couple of times, Mr Lloyd submitted that Australia, and an attempt, I'm, this is not an exact quote, it's a paraphrase, Australia ought not to be bound to tolerate the presence of a person in Australia because of what might happen if that person were removed. My answer is trite, and it ought to be, I'll draw that. This case is not about, as admin law rarely is, about whether the minister could have, <laughs> after considering uh, this relevant point, whether the minister could have cancelled the visa. That's not an issue that ground one of my client's application invites this court to conclude. It's no part of our argument and it would violate orthodox principles of administrative law. Our point is that the minister having erected his own criterion of concern and in light of the singular evidence before him, setting aside questions of common knowledge, indicating that anti-vax sentiment clearly was being provoked by the coercive state action that had been engaged in at the airport, the cancellation. Drawing from the same underlying principles as CWY20, it was unreasonable for the minister not to consider that evidence, the only evidence, in assessing what the impact of either of the binary decisions would be. Of course, ultimately matters of weight were for the minister. Our point is, as a matter of fact, it clearly was not evaluated and it follows that the decision ought to be set aside. Your Honour, may I say something about my friend's reply? Uh, in a moment, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Lloyd. In a moment, Mr. Lloyd. Your Honours, the only thing I wanted to say, again, is not um, earth shattering, but in terms of relief, if the court were persuaded there were jurisdictional error, we would seek not only quashing, but an order requiring immediate release, say within 30 minutes or, or thereof, of the court's decision. 
uh, an order of substantially the same kind was made by Judge Kelly on Monday in the week past. And of course, the court is aware of this, um, but there are many cases obviously where if circumstances of urgency demand, of course, it's open to the court to deliver orders in advance of reasons if the time permitting would not allow for the articulation of fulsome reasons. Yes, Mr Lloyd. Uh, two things, one in relation to that, well, two, two things. One is my friend's case in paragraph 19 of his amended application in ground one is premised upon the minister having not considered the matter in 18b. In his reply, much of his reply was spent saying, well, even if he did consider it, he didn't do, he was unreasonable in what he did. But that's not the case. We haven't come to answer that case. That is a different ground. Um, and we say, Your Honour, should this, insofar as it exceeds the pleaded ground in ground one, Your Honour, should not be embracing this idea that this case is about the reasonableness of the decision per se, or even if he had considered these things, it was still unreasonable. But that is not, we, we can't deal with that now, and that's not the case. Just let me, let me, um, examine that for a moment. Your, your argument uh, is uh, that you put in writing and orally um, is that these things were considered and even if they weren't considered, there's no jurisdictional error. That the failure to consider them is not a jurisdictional error. Yeah, quite, quite. Um, what we haven't addressed is whether, even if they were considered, they were still it was still unreasonable for the other reasons that my friend sought to develop in his reply. Okay. Mr. Mr. Wood, did you want to say something? I, I, I do. Uh, I think it's become important to clarify this because there seems to be genuine confusion. The point is this. We say, and we've used different terms, but I've focused in reply on the term unreasonable. It was unreasonable not to consider. Yeah. Not that the consideration, getting into the merits, if you like, was unreasonable. Quite clearly, our point is it wasn't considered in the sense it was not evaluated. Now, to be perfectly clear, 18B of our amended application said relevantly, the question of whether cancellation of consequent detention and so forth of Mr Djokovic on the basis of a few lines of text he said two years ago may also foster anti-vaccination sentiment and if so the significance of that to the assessment of the public interest in the exercise of discretion. So the point that I was emphasising in reply picking up on the questions from the bench was let it be assumed that the Minister is aware of evidence, in other words, had read the BBC report fully, was therefore aware that there had been, as that report said, galvanisation of the anti-vaxxer community following from the cancellation. Awareness of that evidence, this is really... Not, it's not right. consideration. Awareness, exactly. And, and, our you, point is, and the way you put your argument is I, I would appreciate it. And if... if if this is not correct, my appreciation is faulty, that if if the court were of the view uh, that uh, Mr Lloyd's submission should be accepted about consideration, um, uh, you have a problem. You, 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 ground one is uh, ground one is dismissed. I agree. So if if, if, if the court finds that the minister did consider in the evaluative sense, not just aware of evidence, but considered it in assessing whether public interest lay or whether discretion should be exercised, then on ground one, I lose. Yeah, okay. Mr Lloyd, is that? I, I accept that, you know, if, if that's how my friend puts the case, then I accept that that's within the bounds of his, his application. Right. The, the only other matter I was going to raise, which doesn't arise from a reply, but only from what he said at the, the very last bit, but I apprehend that the court 
if the court makes a decision today, if it's obviously in my client's favour, then I have nothing further to say. But if any one or more of the grounds are upheld, and I, apprehending that the court won't obviously be in a position to give reasons today, it would still be of assistance to my client in order to inform any further steps he may wish to take um, to know which grounds um, right. were, were, were said to be made out. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Um, thank you. Just a moment. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Holmes and Mr. Wood, Mr. Um, Lloyd, and your juniors and solicitors for the careful and thoughtful way uh, the arguments have been put together and with the economy of their delivery. The court uh, uh, proposes to adjourn. Um, what we would hope to do uh, is to uh, spend the afternoon, uh, hopefully, and perhaps uh, the early evening, dealing with the arguments that uh, have been put to the court, not with a view to delivering full reasons today, but with a view, uh, if possible, to uh, reach a view as to the uh, outcome of the matter. Uh, and on one hypothesis, if it be relevant, Mr Lloyd, um, the um, uh, individual basis for it, if that uh, is um, view of the court, um, uh, we would hope to do that later in the afternoon. And so, in a sense, uh, we're not asking counsel and solicitors to stand down in, in, their, in their present position, as it were, but um, uh, we would hope to be in a position to identify to the parties um, uh, later in the afternoon uh, what the course is that we uh, propose and then we, on one view, may we'll come back this afternoon or perhaps tomorrow morning to deal with um, the matter in the best way we can uh, and uh, uh, take it from there. Um, and we'll make... Uh, some form of announcement um, uh, on the court website if the matter is to be relisted and when it will be relisted. Is that satisfactory to the parties? Yes, Your Honour. Yes, Your Honour. Yes, Your Honour. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, the court will adjourn um, uh, uh, on, uh, in the circumstances that I, that I have identified. All stand, this boy is now dead.